Swinburne University of Technology. Hi everyone, in this video we are going to be talking about statistical inference. So inference is the process by which we use a sample to be able to say things or draw conclusions about the population that we are interested in. So a large amount of statistics, and in fact one of the big powers of statistics, is that we can do this. We can take a sample, and if we've done a good job of taking our sample, then we can use our sample to say things about the population. So we're going to do this by way of example. So I've got this example here, so you can imagine uh, that we're interested in this polit particular political party called PEP. And we've gone and surveyed 100 people. And 55 out of the 100 people we surveyed said they would vote for PEP. And we're working on the basis that if you get 50%, more than 50% of the vote, then you are going to win. So we have a sample percentage of 55%. What we want to do is we want to try and determine, is this sufficient evidence in this sample for us to conclude that when we look at all the votes, uh, so when the voting happens, that PEP will actually win the election. So when it comes time to look at the population figure, when everyone votes, do we think that they will get more than 55%? So what we need to think about is what, what, how, how happy are we with this, this 55 out of 100 people? How much evidence does that give me that that would translate into a population figure of more than 50%? So let's imagine that maybe the electorate, uh, and I guess maybe we're talking about a decent chunk of a country if it's 10 million people. Let's suppose there's 10 million people who voted and let's imagine that 99% of these people voted for other parties. This means that if 99% of people voted for other parties, that there is 100,000 people out there who would vote for the PEP party. So it's definitely possible that, given there's 100,000 people who did vote for the party, that we could have found 55 of them just by chance. In fact, it could even be possible in our one or two surveys that you went out and just by chance all 100 people voted for them. What we need to do though is we need to work out well how likely or how unlikely is it that we could get 55%, 55 out of 100 in our survey, but less than 50% in the population end up voting for PEP. So you may have heard the term p-value before, and so p-value is basically just a probability. And so for a statistician, when they are generating a p-value, the p-value is the chance or the probability that we would see this particular sample, or one that's even more unusual, uh, given a particular scenario. So for this example, our p-value is going to tell me what's the chance that I would get 55 or more out of 100 people voting for PEP if in fact in the population less than 50% of people would vote for PEP. And so the p-value we would get is 0.14 and so that's saying well there's actually a 14% chance that even though the survey said 55% in the population the total percentage of votes was less than 50%. If instead of asking 100 people, if we had had 200 people and we still had the same figure of 55%, 55% of our 200 people, the chance of that happening and PEP actually getting less than 50%, so not winning, uh, the p-value drops down to 0.069. So there's only a 6.9% chance that we would see the 55%, but in the population the percentage of votes was less than 50. And so we can have a look at this table and we can see that as the sample size gets bigger, 
the chance that we would have a sample with 55% and yet PEP not win the election gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So if we had a sample of 1,000, our 55% is pretty good evidence that we think PEP is going to win the election. Compared to if we had 500 people, we can see that the p-value is still pretty small, still 1.1%, so still only a pretty small chance that our 55% isn't, uh, isn't matching up to us winning the election. So quite often statisticians will work around a figure of a p-value of 0.05 as being this kind of figure of unlikely. So if we have a p-value smaller than 0.05, then that's what will be telling me uh, in this case that we think that the 55% uh, does translate into an election victory. But it could be other things that we're measuring. It could be a difference between means or a difference between percentages. So there's different kinds of statistical tests that we might do, but generally the, the p-value less than 0.05 is the ones that we're looking out for. In this course we're not having to actually generate the output, but it is really handy for us to keep this in mind if we're reading a statistician's report or if we're reading a journal article when we're looking at our uh, literature review, that when we see these small p-values, these are the ones that we refer to as statistically significant. Okay, so we've had to think about uh, these p-values in terms of sample size. We can also think about them uh, from a fixed sample size, but in terms of our sample percentage. So let's suppose that our sample was going to be 100. That's all we could afford to sample. And let's now have a look at what our p-value would be for different sample percentages. So in that last example, I said that 55%, 55 out of our 100 people said they would vote for PEP. And there was kind of around about 14%, you can see it's 0.136, so 13.6% if we want to be a little bit more specific, um, chance that even though we have this 55% figure, the population figure is below 50%, so we're not winning the election. You can see as we go from 55 to 56 to 57 to 58 to 59 to 60, as our sample percentage gets higher and further away from 50, then that p-value, that probability is getting smaller. So if we narrow in, if we find the first one that is less than 0.05, and we can see it's here, we've got a 0.044. The other way we can think about this is we can say, okay, well, if I took my sample of 100 people and 58% of them were going to vote for PEP, then I think that is pretty likely, likely enough, um, given that 0.05 benchmark, that that's going to translate into an election victory when we look at the population. So that sample of 100 people, the 58%, and so if we had a 59% or we had a 60%, that would be even more compelling evidence that we think that the, the population percentage of people voting for PEP is greater than 50%. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight about what's going on with uh, statistical inference. Really the key message, we're looking for those low p-values. The ones below 0.05 are the ones that are telling us that Whatever that we're measuring, so whether it's a difference or a figure, that figure, that difference or that figure in the sample translates into a difference or a figure in the population. So when we're talking about statistically significant, we are with low p-values, we're saying this is something that not only am I observing in the sample, I think the sample gives me enough evidence that it's also occurring in the population. So we might have a uh, statistician might write a report and some of the hypotheses that we might see might be things like maybe we have importance of health scores from a multi-item scale. We've got them for men and women and we want to see whether there is a difference between the mean scores for the men and women. So the means might be different. 
but it will be the p-value in the hypothesis test that tells me whether we think that the difference in the sample means actually translates to differences in the population means and therefore differences between males and females. And so it's going to depend on our sample size and it's going to depend on how much variation or how much spread we have in the data as to how accurately and how easily we can detect these statistically significant differences. So some of the common tests that we might see reported on are the one sample t-test and so that's when we're comparing the mean to a fixed reference value. So if we're looking at a mean it must be a metric variable that we're looking at. Two sample t-test is where we're comparing the means of two independent groups. So we might be uh, comparing mean, say mean scale scores for men and women or for customers and non-customers or for two different countries or two different cities, just any two particular independent groups. Paired t-test is similar where we are looking at mean difference, uh, but this is where we have paired data, so the data is somehow linked. Most commonly it's where we have a before and an after. So we might measure, uh, say, satisfaction before using our product and after using our product. And if we've got a before and an after for each person, those two measurements, they're paired, they're not independent of one another. And so that's where we would use a paired t-test to look for a difference. Another one that we might see is uh, the ANOVA, which is an it's called an analysis of variance, but basically that is a bit like a t-test, it's comparing means, but it's comparing means for when we have more than two groups. So if we have three groups or four groups or more, more than two groups, we use ANOVA to compare the means. And the last common one that we might see written about is a chi-square. And so a chi-square is going to tell me about a relationship between two categorical variables. So we're not going to have to conduct these tests, uh, but we may receive statisticians report and we may need to draw conclusions and write recommendations based on information about them. So we need to be a little bit familiar just just with the names and what they're comparing. Normally the report, if it's been a well-written report, it should be fairly accessible to, for us to read just by knowing about p-values and knowing which test matches to which kind of data. One last thing that we want to think about when we are talking about inference is estimating a parameter. So a parameter is a measurement for a population. It could be a percentage or it could be a mean, it could be some sort of difference. And we want to see how a sample statistics, a measurement for our sample, translates into a population parameter. So in my sample from earlier on, I said 55% of that 100 people would vote for the PEP. So 55% uh, is my sample statistic. This doesn't mean that 55% of my population will vote for PEP. So I shouldn't use that number just by itself. When you use a number by just by itself as an estimate, it's called a point estimate. And point estimates are generally bad. We would hope that our population figure is somewhere near 55%, but it's very unlikely to be exactly 55%. And so what we do is we use what's called a confidence interval. So a confidence interval gives me an interval around a particular estimate. So if I'm interested in the population mean or a population percentage, then what I do is I calculate a confidence interval and it pretty much is saying, I think with a certain, certain level of uh, certainty, uh, and most commonly the, that level of certainty is 95%, but it can be others, that my population parameter, in this case my population percentage, is somewhere between these two figures. So for my example, 55 of my 100 people, 55% said they would vote for PEP, and in terms of a confidence interval, if it's a 95% confidence interval, that's going to translate into me saying 
I'm 95% sure, that's reasonably sure, that the population percentage is somewhere between 45.2 and 64.8%. So I don't know exactly what the population percentage is, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere between those two points. And there's some calculations behind that that uh, we're not going to get into that show that that's, that's a pretty reasonable prediction. I could try and be more sure. If I wanted to be 99% sure instead of 95% sure, what happens is my interval gets a little bit wider. You can see instead of 45 to 64.8, it's now 42 to 67.8. So in order to be more sure, my interval needs to get wider. The other thing that affects the width of the interval is my sample size. As my sample size gets bigger, I have more faith in my estimate, and so the interval will get narrower. So if I had a confidence interval based on my sample of 100 voters, and I have another interval based on a sample of 500 voters, the, the width of the interval, so from bottom to top, would be narrower for the 500 voters than it would be for the 100 voters. So some key points for us to take away from this video. First one is that the p-values tell me about my statistical significance. And in particular, that the small p-values, so less than 0.05, they're indicating that uh, the differences or the relationships that I see in my statistical tests are present in my population. So I my small p-value is saying that based on the sample this gives me strong evidence that in fact this this difference or this relationship is present in my population as well. Second key point is uh, confidence intervals. So a confidence interval is going to be the best way uh, for a estimate to be presented. So if I've got a if I want to describe a population parameter, so a mean or a proportion or a correlation, the very best way for me to talk about the, the population figure is in term of, terms of this interval. As my sample size gets bigger, the interval will get narrower, and vice versa. And as my level of confidence gets higher, my interval will get wider. If I want to be more sure, then the interval needs to get wider. This has been a Swinburne production.